Hey Pokemon fans, Almighty Arceus here with my good friend Birdkeeper Toby. We're doing a series of collaborations that you can find on both my channel and on his channel. There's a total of four videos, so make sure you've caught them all. Today, we're going to be talking about something that I've been wanting to talk about for years at this point. From we all live in a Pokemon world to it all comes together, Pokemon has always focused on bringing the communities of the world together under one roof. With all the various regions that are trading mechanisms within the game, as well as your ability to move freely, say, between Kanto and Johto with all of these powerful Pokemon, it seems like the Pokemon world is a very well-connected place, and yet given that you're traveling freely with Pokemon of immense power, surely there must be some kind of regulation to all this. Who governs the Pokemon world? Who runs it? Where are they? Why have we not seen them, like, at all? And how are they creating this magical world? Like, it's honestly beyond comprehension. Not just the magic of Pokemon, but the magic of teleportation! Technology! Being ubiquitous! Like, what's going on? Who runs this place? Now, before we get onto these big questions, let's start with what we know. Seems like these places in the Pokemon world function much like real societies. We know that there's at least municipal governments in the Pokemon world, where some of the towns have mayors. In the episode The Mystery Menace, there is a mayor of Trovilotopis. Trovilotopis. Trovitopolis. Yeah, that one. And trying to fare well in the next election for mayor, he's trying to deal with a menace in the sewers by blocking all the exits and entrances. Also, in Pokemon Black and White's Oculipid City... Oculipid... Oculipid... What is with all these names? We have Drayden, who is not only the gym leader, but also the mayor of that town. So clearly, each town seems to have its own kind of government. This kind of municipal government and cultural practice is well established in Pokemon Sun and Moon Generation 7 with the Kahuna system. Kahunas are some of the best battlers of all of the islands of Alola, who are there to lead not only ritual battles and cultural practices, but also to lead the governments of each of the corresponding islands. Some of them even serve as police officers, heads of police departments, and have even collaborated with the international government and the international police force. So, for the most part in Pokemon, whether it's in the anime or in the games, it's implied that there's some sort of basic municipal government established. Oftentimes it's some sort of democratically elected mayor, as we've seen in Pokemon Black and White. But in the case of Alola and Pokemon Sun and Moon, we do actually see the strongest battlers holding the highest positions of authority in the land. We also know that many public services are provided for absolutely free in the Pokemon world. For example, the police force in Officer Jenny's and the Pokemon Centers, of course, our healthcare system run by Nurse Joys. Pokemon Centers are found literally everywhere in the Pokemon world. They're in every region across the entire globe. And they also have a feature that tends to connect the rest of the Pokemon world to each other. That's the GTS, the Global Trading System. This was prominently established in Generation 4 and has since received a bunch of different iterations, whether in the Pokemon Center or not, but these Pokemon Centers are very famous for connecting people from different regions. And we know that the Pokemon world is vast. I mean, Kalos and Unova and Alola exist, so obviously it's very spread out, yet Pokemon centers are consistent throughout all regions. While it may not be unusual for a business to spread worldwide, it is unusual that something like the Pokemon Center that literally doesn't charge any money for you to use it is somehow spread worldwide. This would suggest that it's not necessarily a business, but rather a public utility, something that is accessible by everyone globally. It's a global public utility. What that means is that it's not a business running the Pokemon Centers at all, no, no. It's a Pokemon government running these Pokemon Centers and setting them up worldwide. And sure, in some later generations and games, the Pokemon has moved into the Pokemon Center, but that seems to be more a game mechanic than any kind of business choice on the Pokemon Center's part. It's more likely that the Pokemon coupled with the government entity that runs the Pokemon Centers. But what we do know is not all regions have this. It's not just some kind of update thing. Auras's Pokemon Marts are still outside of the Pokemon Centers. Another international entity that we have confirmed in multiple Pokemon games is the existence of a global police force also known as the International Police. It closely parallels Interpol of our real world, but it seems to have a lot more power and influence and money than the Interpol of our world does. 
Famous detectives like Looker and Annabelle and Nanu have been on Pokemon crisis response teams that have gone throughout the world to fight Ultra Beasts. We've also seen independent investigations led by the likes of Looker, and this has been investigations into a lot of the evil teams that exist throughout the Pokemon world, whether it be Sharon in Pokemon Platinum when Looker first made his debut, in Generation 5 with the Seven Sages of Team Plasma, or with Xerosis of X and Y in Generation 6. All three were put to justice by the international police in the name of Looker. Now it does seem like they have a much larger influence than we even are aware of. I mean, the fact that they were such a big part of the post game of Generation 7 and deal with international interdimensional threats means that they must have a lot of power and influence around. Not to mention, they give you the most money you can ever earn at one time in a Pokemon game by giving you 1 million Poke Yen. That's a ton of money. And that's another thing, money. There is a single unit of currency in the Pokemon world, the Poke Yen or dollar or coin. And with this currency, you can go anywhere and buy, well, pretty much the same products for the same prices because across the world of Pokemon, pretty much every item is consistent in its pricing. Game Freak has tweaked these from time to time, but probably more for balancing sake. And it doesn't seem impossible for a kid in the world of Pokemon to become a millionaire. There's just not an awful lot that they can actually spend it on. We've also encountered various NPCs that seem to come from different parts of the Pokemon world. I mean, we have that Team Rocket grunt from Heart Gold and Soul Silver that eventually ended up settling in Unova and speaks a lot more clearly, talks about, you know, being from different parts of the world, going to different parts of the world. His travel is very easy. We also have Fantine from Generation 4 who spoke with a French accent, but now that we know the existence of Kalos, it's very likely that she actually came from the Kalos region. We have Looker with his different ways of speaking, though he also most naturally speaks uh, in the Kalos region, suggesting that might be where he's native to. It seems pretty simple for people to exist from regions that aren't their home region in the Pokemon world. In fact, you can actually transit between Kanto and Johto without any passport, any documentation, anything whatsoever. You just literally need to have stronger Pokemon. That's it. Finally, finally, there is the matter of the Pokemon War. Ah yes, the ever-elusive Pokemon theory spurred on by Lieutenant Surge's line of dialogue about how his electric Pokemon saved him during the war. And we know this war totally happened. It is the theory as to why a lot of the father figures in the Pokemon world are gone and not in the games. Why there seems to be this whole government surrounding training up Pokemon trainers for fighting. Why there's underground evacuation tunnels from the main city centers of Kanto. The list goes on. I've talked about it all a lot on my channel before. What we do know is that Lieutenant Surge, the Lightning American, as he sa it says on his placard, suggests that maybe he comes from Unova, a region based off of America, or Alola, which is based off of Hawaii, again, another American state. The point is, we don't know whether America also exists in the Pokemon world in addition to Unova or Alola, or whether th there's something else going on there. Though there is very little other detail, we do know that around 20 to 40 years ago, depending on Lieutenant Surge's age, there was a war in which he was the Lightning American. Before we put all our evidence together, let's look at the most popular fan theory that most people generally answer this question with, and that's the idea that the Pokemon government is made up of gym leaders and Elite Four trainers, and they're the ones who create all the policy, right? The biggest bit of evidence towards this theory is the Pokemon League. If there is some kind of centralized government, perhaps this is it. These are the only characters who seem to really have authority in the Pokemon world, and in a whole world about Pokemon training and battling, it makes sense that the strongest lead. We also have an extra bit of evidence to gym leaders being the sort of like government leader heads in Dryden. Again, he is a gym leader who is also a mayor, so perhaps gym leaders are like heads of states and elite fours are like, well, they're the tippy top of the government. But this falls apart a little bit because Dryden is the only uh, mayor that we know, out of the gym leaders that we know for sure. On top of that, Giovanni is a crime boss, so I doubt he's uh, particularly into his politics. I mean, maybe he is. But he did see Pokemon as tools for business. His Team Rocket, it was a business that he was running as opposed to some kind of government entity. Honestly, this is why we find this to be such a weak piece of evidence. If the Pokemon government was run by the Pokemon League, that would mean that the Pokemon League would have authority over Pokemon centers, over economic policy, over legislation in the Pokemon world, and we never see them involved in any of this kind of stuff. If they were to be involved in that, you would see them doing those kinds of things on a day-to-day -day basis. And it's not like they just took that out of the game because it's boring for kids. 
I mean, Drayden specifically has the role of mayor in addition to being a gym leader. So he's wearing separate hats. It's not like because he's a gym leader, he is the mayor, because that would mean that in the other version, Iris would be the mayor, which makes no sense. Drayden is still the mayor in that game. He's still occupying that hat. He still holds that position. And so that means by extension that most of these roles aren't going to be dealing with any sort of government whatsoever. Being a gym leader and being a part of the Elite Four, even being the champion, doesn't give you any authority. Hell, if the champion had any sort of legal authority, that would mean in Generation 7 you'd basically become the president of the Alola region. And as cool as that sounds, I don't really think that's the way it works at all. So if not gym leaders, then who, if anyone at all, who is the government in the world of Pokemon? Now comes my theory. I believe that the Pokemon world is governed by a great international government that controls legislation and policy distribution as well as resource distribution, the proliferation of Pokemon centers throughout the Pokemon world. They're also the ones that are responsible for helping technology flow from place to place, from helping transportation be so easy from region to region, and just generally uniting the Pokemon world into what we know it is. It is generally a utopic socialist technocracy that envelops the Pokemon world. Now, I just threw some really big political science words at you, so let's break it down as to what those mean. Utopic refers to a utopia, a perfect place to live. In the Pokemon world, there's no homeless people. There are hardly even that many sick people. And it's because these people are tended to in their times of need. Everybody has their basic needs met. They're all living in a place that's essentially paradise. And the only way it gets mucked up is when there's evil teams that come in or Ultra Beasts come from another dimension. But for the most part, this Pokemon government is striving to make the Pokemon world a utopia and doing a pretty darn good job at it. Utopia describes the quality of life in the Pokemon universe. Socialism is the basic idea that the community should own resources rather than necessarily having resources be privatized. And while we do see some private goods in the Pokemon world, most notably most of the stuff you need to battle that's sold by big corporations like Silphco, we also see resources pretty freely distributed. We obviously have housing for everybody. There's no homeless people. There's food for everybody. There's universalized healthcare for both people and Pokemon. So we see the basic needs being met in the Pokemon world. Heck, you even see technology given out for free, like the Pokedex, the Pokenav, the cell phone that you receive, the Poketch. All of these things are given out for free and something that's made available for you very easily in the Pokemon world. So socialism describes the social philosophy of the Pokemon world. This is generally how people interact. They are generally community focused and that's a big theme of the Pokemon games, community and bringing things together. It all comes together under communism. A technocracy is a government run by technological elites, people who are extreme brainiacs, super smart, and that create technological advancements for society at large to use. Uh, you know, in today's society, someone like Elon Musk, maybe, I guess, I don't know, would qualify as someone who would be a technocrat, someone who is concerned about furthering the advancements of technology to aid humanity generally. And this is definitely what we see in the Pokemon world. There's a big overarching theme of tradition meeting the future, meeting technology, meeting all of these things, meshing together, but also kind of in contrast. We see so much technology that is just ubiquitous, spread all out across the Pokemon world. Obviously the invention of the Pokeball, teleportation, Pokemon centers that instantly heal your Pokemon, all of these kinds of resources are readily available throughout the Pokemon universe. And most of the prominent characters that we know aside from gym leaders and the Elite Four are technocrats. These are people who are huge geniuses who are either running huge technological corporations or trying to distribute their technology to the world at large. Bill, Mr. Fuji, Giovanni, Lusamine, Devin, Steven Stone. These are all people that are huge characters in the Pokemon games that are also hugely involved in science and technology. Now, I'm not saying that they necessarily control the Pokemon world, though Bird Keeper Toby might get into that a little bit, but they do obviously have a lot of influence and whoever does control the Pokemon world, whatever government entity is set up, probably gets a lot of their technology and a lot of the influence from the lobbying from these big corporations and these technological groups of people. 
A technocracy describes the political philosophy of the Pokemon world, a world fueled by technological advancement. Well, Arceus, I gotta say, there is a lot of good points here and a lot of evidence, and it explains a lot. The idea that maybe there was a Pokemon War 20 to 40 years before the start of Red and Blue. Perhaps there was an America, and after the Pokemon War, it got broken down into regions instead of states, including Unova and Alola. America fought in that war, and the outcome was a treaty which broke the world down into Pokemon regions that were controlled by one big government Pokemon entity. The more we think about it, the more that it does seem that the Pokemon world is governed by an international government that wants to provide for everybody and that wants to see technology flow across the nations that exist within this international entity. Or regions, I guess you would call them now, because they're technically one nation. They're an international government, united by one government, one nation, but multiple regions. You have the regional decks for the region that you're in. That's why the region exists. But then you also have the national decks that encompassed all of the regions that you've been to before. So there is this united one nation in the Pokemon world that has always been there. We've always known that the Pokemon government has united all of these regions under one nation. But now we know a little bit more about the political, social, and economic philosophies of this Pokemon world. You've got your American Unova or your French-based Chaos, a future where we've ditched the barriers that we've currently created and instead we just have regions of one Pokemon world under one international government. And when no one in the world is fighting each other, all that's left are for crime bosses and evil syndicates to rise up. You're right on it, Toby. These aren't any sort of national entities whatsoever. They don't war against each other. These are more like terrorist groups. These are more like mobs. These are more like gangsters that manifest within the separate regions that eventually the national, international police will take care of, or you, yourself, the protagonist, will take care of as well. Team Rocket is best characterized as, you know, a group of thugs, gangsters, with Giovanni as the Italian mobster at the top. Then you have Team Aqua and Team Magma, which can arguably be compared to ecological terrorists, and their whole motive is to either flood the land masses or create more land masses and just destroy the world and be diabolical, but they're obviously put to a stop by you and the forces around you. You have Team Galactic that just wants to end the world. That's just, you know, this one lone wolf organization that kind of decides they want to do that. And they're not fighting against any particular thing. They're just kind of fighting against existence. You have Team Plasma, which actually does kind of imitate a political insurrection. Its whole idea is to challenge the Pokemon world and the way things are. That's what made Generation 5 so interesting, the fact that we had this more mature plot questioning the entire setup of the world that we had before. Why do we capture Pokemon? Why do we have this system that is ruled by technology? Why do we have this overarching international government? But of course he wanted to install a dictatorship instead and be the sole autocrat, the sole ruler. Uh, so that didn't really blow over well and once again put to a stop by a singular kid And then you have generation 16 flare Which is just a technocrat actually Rebelling and deciding that the world should end because the world is impure or some you know Whatever like that Lysander you're really crazy And then you have generation 7 where that's more of a personal plot You don't actually end up seeing any sort of evil organization aside from the street thugs of team uh, skull <laughs> They're not exactly the most threatening evil team we've ever been up against. The real threat is Ultra Beasts, and we end up fighting against those creatures and really having that be the driving force of the plot rather than necessarily an evil team that we've seen in the prior six generations. So you see all of these different iterations of just little small conflicts, no sorts of big Pokemon wars like supposedly happened before any of these generations began but more these internal conflicts that are influenced by big key players that end up changing the Pokemon world at large. Now, why is it that every time you, a kid, is the one who defeats these evil organizations? Well, for that, I'm gonna have to refer you to Birdkeeper Toby's conspiracy theory over on his channel. I chime in a little bit to give a piece of my mind on that as well. But that doesn't mean I can't get a little bit dark here as well. Think about the fact that every single Pokemon Center in this international world is run by a Nurse Joy. Literally, they're the same people. Is it possible that they just look the same because they're all part of one big family? Come on, even relatives don't look that closely related over that many different people. In the anime, they explain it as one big ridiculous family, but what if it's a little bit darker than that? What if there is no multitude of joys? There's just one joy. 
one joy that was duplicated hundreds of thousands of times over and over. I mean, we haven't counted cloning as a central technology explored in the first generation of Pokemon games with Mew, Mewtwo, and possibly Ditto as well. And given that Mewtwo has human DNA in him, whether that's Blaine's DNA in the manga or possibly Fuji's daughter's DNA in the movies, it seems that the technology to clone humans, to clone human DNA, is there in the world of Pokemon. What if Joy is just a clone, has no existence of its own, but just is there to staff Pokemon centers automatically so they don't have to worry about hiring anybody so that they can keep those services free. What if Joys are all enslaved clones? Oh, maybe that's a little bit too dark, I don't know. But if you wanna look a little bit more on the darker side and uh, take a little bit of a look into the Poke Illuminati. I would go over to Birdkeeper Toby's channel where he's going to be talking all about that. And that's over on my channel and it's worth checking out because if you want to know who's benefiting from this utopic universe, this utopic Pokemon world, well, there are some people. People at the very tippity top. We also have another theory that talks about the Pokemon timeline and there's another one that's going to be up on my channel talking about weird timeline discrepancies as well. So like I said, make sure you've caught all of those videos. I'd once again like to thank Birdkeeper Toby for being a part of this collaboration. Honestly, it was so much fun to do, and I hope we can do more in the future. For now, you'll have to let us know what you think about this theory in the comments. I'm Birdkeeper Toby. I'm Almighty Arcus, and remember to go to Birdkeeper Toby's channel to watch the second part of this theory, where this conspiracy about the Pokemon International Utopic Socialist Technocratic Government gets dark.